flashpoint, we're talking about the economy. Uh, we were discussing the fiscal cliff a few moments ago and what kind of impact it, it would have. And I'm looking at this timeline here and the amount of jobs that could be lost. Uh, you know, it's in the hundreds of thousands if, if they don't come up to a compromise, Sean. And I guess the question I have is, what is the deal? I mean, why, why can't they reach a compromise now of any certainty and any, you know, realistic uh, pract practicality, I guess? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what's going on behind the scenes, but I mean, some of the rhetoric that we've heard thus far sounds uh, pretty similar to the rhetoric we heard prior to the election. So that that's a little disconcerting on one level that, you know, the outcome of the election is known. Uh, let's move forward. Um, but what's happening behind the scenes, it's not clear. I mean, it's really coming down to how do we address the deficit? How do we close the deficit? How do we address the, the national debt in the long run? And it's got to come uh, with a combination of increased revenue, uh, whether it's tax cuts inspire, uh, expiring or uh, eliminating or capping deductions that people could take, but it's also got to address the spending side and entitlements. And, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, the mix between the two seems to be where the rub is right now. Um, and how does that actually affect our state legislators, this new wave of state legislators headed up to Tallahassee? They have, they have a, um, a surplus right now, which is a word we haven't heard in a long time. Um, but there's uncertainty in, in how they can move forward with our own state budget, not knowing what the federal government is doing. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, I, yeah. Th I think that's probably the case. Um, I think in the last few days, we've seen um, some backing off of the talk about surplus, some you know more uncertainty entering the conversation there. Um, so there, there are a lot of question marks. I think the results of the election are very interesting. Um, Sean's right. Some of the rhetoric we're hearing now about fiscal cliff and, and, and federal um, tax policy is some of what we heard before the election, and you would think that would have changed somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, but even locally, we saw some um, incumbent legislators turned out and um, replaced with um, challengers that probably weren't given much of a shot at the beginning, and that certainly will have an influence when they go to Tallahassee this spring. Not necessarily a political guy, Tom, but yeah. you are involved in state finances as sure. prepaid college. Absolutely. I mean, you guys got to make decisions based on the economic environment. And you have to do it on behalf of the entire constituency yeah. right. of Florida, basically. So right. how do you all deal with all the political wrangling? Well, on, on the, the state college board, it's, it's not too difficult. We have a, um, an investment policy in place that really dictates what we do, and, you know, that that uh, portfolio did very, very well in 2008 because it's a, it's a very conservatively run portfolio. So we haven't had to really monitor too much what was happening politically. It didn't have an impact on the investments per se. Now, again, on, on the individual side, that's a different story. And, you know, Sean mentioned it, but the fact of the matter, people are scared. Mm -hmm. People just don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. And... It, it's it's just a difficult time not knowing where things are going to be, you know, at, at a set point. And it kind of reminds me of back when our, our debt was downgraded, you know, about a year and a half ago. We're really, we, we've been living through this almost since the, the 2008 recession started. How do you calm their fears? I mean, moving forward into the kind of the tip section here, what are the tried and true advice that you're giving across the board to your <laughs> clients, you know, um, other than stay the course, because I know yeah. you guys always say stay the course. But, um, you know, and you, have, you have clients of much, you know, lots of different levels. But right. what are the tried and true tips that you're giving them going into the end of this year and into next year? What well, are some of the, yeah. or, maybe, or maybe should I say, what are, what are yeah. some of the things that are a little more unique for this particular period? Yeah, tried and true is a, is a, a difficult way to approach it. But you know, what, what we have done is, is we've taken a, a pretty defensive posture and we took a little bit of a defensive posture leading up to the election. After the election, frankly, we took a little bit more of a defensive posture. We took probably 10 or 15 percent of our most aggressive pieces off the table for any client that was in them. And, you know, as clients are asking me now, what do you think, what are we going to do? I believe what people want to hear is, Yes, we're looking at it, we're looking at it on an ongoing basis, and we're going to make proactive decisions to help ensure that you know, your money, your investments are doing what they're supposed to be doing. In fact, I, I hope it does not get to this, but we already have the next tranche, the next 10 or 15% of investment assets that we will sell and go to cash 
if we feel we need to be more defensive. Not everybody has a financial advisor, though, and so for those people out there, you know, regardless, you first of all, you don't necessarily believe in um, investment based on age. That you, you're not one of those. Clearly, the aggressiveness of your investments does have something to do with how close you are to retirement. Everybody Correct. knows that, but you believe that people do need to look at it more specifically. The average person out there, should they be getting, should they still be getting out of those aggressive investments in your opinion? Are we still in that place where you need to be wary of those? You're not quite ready to jump back in that again for the average person? I, I, I think it does in that situation for the average person. It depends on age. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think if you, you know, if you're Beth's age here, you've got some time to let, let things iron themselves out, especially retirement plans. But I think the bottom line is you need to be in a situation where you're invested aggressively enough to where you can potentially reap some benefits if things are going well, but conservatively enough that when you hit the, the bed at night and your, your head hits the pillow that you're not concerned what the market's going to do the next day. What, pe what, what returns should people be getting right now? Well, I mean, we've had a good year this year, and, mm -hmm. and that actually was part of the reason we felt so comfortable taking some off the table. I mean, we took some off the table up 15, 18 percent for the year. So what should they be getting this year? People should be ranging between 8 and 12 percent would be a good range. Sean, would but you agree with that, basically? Uh, overall uh, return on investment? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I wish I could get that. <laughs> <laughs> However, that being said, you know, what, what I tell people to anticipate going forward is, I mean, I, I tell them to look at maybe a 6% long-term return. Okay. And, and I would like to think that's conservative, but um, so we, we never know. So it does depend on who you know and what Absolutely. you can afford. <laughs> Shot, let me ask you this. Looking forward, what are going to be the hot things that people are going to be looking at in the next year. I mean, let's, let's, let's go forward and look at, at some of the good things, uh, some of the things when you're out there looking at the trends, um, what people are putting their money into, what might actually start moving. We know real estate is actually doing pretty well right now. Um, so what are your thoughts on that, on the trends that we're going to see in the next year? Yeah, I, mean, I do think real estate is starting to show signs of, uh, of a recovery or at least a, a pulse uh, when it's been flatlined for many years now. So I think you're going to continue to see that. Um, you know, what, what, what are the potential upside? Well, you know, if we, if we could get our arms around the, the, the deficit and the debt and come up with a, you know, a short run and a, a long run solution to the problems that we face, I think that could really unleash uh, the economy and could unleash financial markets. I mean, if we got this grand solution that addressed Social Security and Medicare, the tax structure was reformed, and you know we don't have these ongoing nagging problems that don't ever seem to go away. I, you know, I, I think that could really unleash uh, economic growth and, and that investment and all those forward-looking decisions. People would feel comfortable making them. All right, always the optimist, Dr. Snaith over here. All right, we'll be right back. We're talking about the economy here on Flashpoint. Stay with us. Welcome back to Flashpoint. On an occasion, um, an elected official might actually catch my show, so they might be listening to you right now. And Beth, we'd had a conversation before we began. Um, we were talking about, uh, you know, um, lawmakers and tax cuts, and there still seems to be such a huge uh, emphasis on that. But that's not what you're necessarily hearing is still important to those people out there in the community. Well, sure. In Tallahassee, we hear a lot of discussion about corporate tax breaks, and especially when the conversation turns to incentives. The idea is always that incentives are based around tax rebates, tax cuts, that if only we could, we could push taxes down a little bit farther, then more CEOs would want to move their companies to Florida. And I think what gets lost in that conversation so many times is the idea that many CEOs are regular people like everyone else, and they are looking at things like very much quality of life issues. So education, what are the public schools like? Transportation, do people have a way to get around in, you know, town? And so a lot of times we see Tallahassee talking about economic development and wanting to cut tax rates, but at the same time they're taking money out of schools and out of transportation. And, and those two things just don't really jive. And you are a CEO of a fairly uh, small business, right? Yes, Considered exactly. a small business, obviously. So, you, would you well, agree? Not, with not according to the election. But. Oh, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but would you agree with Beth that it is? It's not just about tax cuts, but taxes still are weighing heavily on you. Well, I, I, I definitely I agree with everything Beth said, but I would throw in some additional thoughts, which is, you know, with with the tax cuts, if they do expire, 
just in, in my position as a small business owner, I, I literally would be paying more in taxes that could bring on a, a top-notch person for my business. So it would keep a small business like mine from having the ability to grow. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, you know, my business has nine employees, you take that and start compounding it to much larger businesses, and, and these businesses are scared. And until, until they have a feel for what they're going to be able to spend money on and how much taxes are going to be and how much health care is going to be, et cetera, et cetera, they are not going to be willing to go out and hire a lot of people and spend more money on inventory and all the things that businesses need to be doing to get our economy going. And we're always looking for high wage workers too. I mean, that's what we're trying to attract to Florida. And you only have a minute left, Sean, okay. but we've had the governor recently talk about, um, you know, challenging universities on tuition, an interesting initiative, which Beth called out as something that's probably not realistic in one of her columns. But we also have, you know, uh, Senator Andy Gardner, who, who has talked about how he wants to let, take a, a baseline look at tax incentives and whether they actually work. So moving forward, if they're listening, what, what, what are you telling legislators? What would your advice be if they move forward to keep this economy going this year? Uh, well, I think I agree with Beth. I mean, I, you know, I think we, we don't have much more room as far as uh, the race to the bottom as far as taxes are concerned. I mean, we're, we're in the bottom five uh, of all states, so we're not really going to gain traction there. I think a much more powerful pheromone to attract businesses are these quality of life issues, are K through 12 education, high quality schools, a strong university system, community college system. And, and you need to invest in these things, but to invest you need revenue. And so, you know, we keep cutting revenue and cutting taxes, but there's nothing left to plow back into uh, the economy in these type of investments that ultimately, I think, pay much larger dividends down the line than a little tweak of a corporate tax rate. Right. Can't wait to get you guys in here next quarter and see how we went <laughs> over the next couple of months, right? Because, again, uncertainty, uncertainty. All right. Tom, Beth, Sean, thank you all so much. A lot thank of you, interesting Lauren. information today. And good luck in this end of the uh, year. And uh, if you ever miss Flashpoint, you can find it on clickorlando.com under interactive. Have a great week and tell your friends about Flashpoint.